Hello. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us uh, today. So today, in this session, we are going to speak about containers, Kubernetes, and a little bit about AI, but all of this in the context of Podman Desktop. So we are two for this session. Myself, I'm Steven Lemer. I'm product manager working on developer tools at Red Hat. And I am in charge of uh, Podman Desktop. And we also have Cedric Cliburn. Hey, everybody. My name is Cedric. I'm a developer advocate at Red Hat. And thank you all for being here. Thank you, Cedric. So what's the schedule for us uh, today? So we are going to, to, to speak a little bit about Podman, Podman Desktop. And we will also introduce a, a new tool in the Podman family. But it's, it's quite interesting to take a step back, because last year we were doing a, a presentation about Podman Desktop. And we just uh, announced the first GA of, uh, of Podman Desktop last year. And since that, we released 10 major releases. And each month, we've been introducing new capabilities. And I want to take the time to thank all of you, because you've been providing so much, done, so much uh, feedback, so much uh, help into shaping the tool in a way that is efficient for you. And today, we reach more than 1 million downloads of the tool. So again, thank you. OK, so let's get started. What's Podman, Cedric? Thanks, Stevan. As you can tell, he's a happy product manager. So <laughs> congratulations on the million. Um, to many more. Now, <laughs> I want to talk real quick about Podman itself as a container engine so we can kind of introduce and talk about Podman Desktop after and then all the capabilities. Um, have any of us worked with Podman as a container engine? OK, sweet. So you might already know the benefits, but I'll kind of talk about it and at the same time introduce the seals, which are these uh, really cool and fun mascots of the project. You'll see them on the website, on all the blogs, when you use Podman Desktop itself. Um, and I love this illustration here because it kind of illustrates uh, a little bit more than what's just on the surface because you have multiple seals here, right? The mascot of the project. And um, essentially, we, we show the containers here, but a group of seals is called a pod, hence the name the Podman Project and Pod Manager. So we're working with not only just images and containers, but also pods. And with Podman Desktop, the ability to deploy to Kubernetes environments, and it's really, really exciting. So of course, we had to give them some Red Hat swag, and you know they're proudly displaying the flag of the conference. Um, but Podman is a project to make your life easier when you're working with containers. So um, if you haven't heard of it before, similar to Docker, Podman is a container engine to work with images, containers, volumes, registries, uh, work with Kubernetes, and much, much more. And the two things that I would love for you to know about Podman uh, as a container engine is firstly, it's a very fast and light container engine because it has a slightly different architecture where instead of having a background daemon running uh, your, and working with your containers as a process on your host, what's happening with the Podman architecture is that you're essentially forking uh, and, and um, creating a new process of Podman, which then becomes the container. And so uh, this is controlled with systemd, and it makes things a little bit more uh, intuitive and less of a, of a, of a um, essentially a monolithic process where we now just have Podman forking itself. Those containers then run as processes. And it's a really cool architecture that allows for a lot of um, features that we're going to show today. And because of that, one of the most important things is it's a very secure container engine. Um, so because of that daemonless architecture, what we're able to do is run containers by default in a rootless fashion. Uh, and that's really important for your attack surface, for working with security. But also, if you're in a large enterprise, you might not have access to uh, pseudo or root access. And being able to run containers in a non-root fashion um, instantly with working with Podman is a huge thing for adopting and working with containers. Now, I'll, I'll quickly speak about Podman as an open source project. Of course, everything we do at Red Hat is open source, but there's um, essentially open source first mentality. There's no lock-in. You can use this in your enterprises. There's no restrictions. Uh, it's just a great way to work with these containers, and it's compatible with the OCI format for images, containers, and much, much more. So um, it's a great way to work with not only containers, but also uh, beyond that. So 
you can work with your Compose applications for multi-container apps, uh, spin those up with the Podman Compose, which is supported with Podman Desktop uh, as a, um, a, a format. So we also have support for Docker Socket. If you want to replicate uh, extensions that might not already have support for Podman, we can replicate that socket and, and still use those in extensions. And of course, WebAssembly to get both the benefits of WASM and containers all in one place. And the last thing I'll say about Podman as an as a engine itself is that it's not just for local development, but you can actually use it in production environments. And there's a lot of really cool case studies on redapp.com about big agencies that have used Podman in a variety of different use cases. There's a really cool one with NASA that I, I love to talk about. But I'll be brief, so I'll say that uh, whether you're working with systemd to control containers or you want to put systemd in a container, Podman makes it really easy to be able to do that uh, and manage containers when you don't need a situation like Kubernetes. Um, but a lot of developers are targeting Kubernetes right to, uh, to work with multi-container applications, which is what we're going to see today. So I want to uh, just kind of close out by saying whether you're working with uh, containers from your CLI or, or working with Kubernetes and maybe you don't need a cluster or you do need a cluster, Podman's a great developer tool and it's free to use uh, on github.com slash containers slash Podman. I'll pass it over to you, Stevan. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Cedric. Uh, yeah, so as you can see, Podman is already a, a pretty compelling solution to work with containers and to run it on, uh, on production. But how do we bring it to you, application developer? And that's where Podman Desktop is here. It's, so what's Podman Desktop? It's the best open source developer tool to work with containers and to work with Kubernetes. And you know it's important today in our day-to-day -day job because local developer environments, they have become impractical and they lack of consistency with production environments. There are a lot of challenges. One of them um, is getting a local developer environment up and running, and a, there are a lot of things that are complicated to set up. And your laptop is naturally having limited resources compared to your production environment. It also lack of consistency because the way you run the things locally on your environment uh, are unlikely to be the way you are going to run them in a live uh, environment, especially if you are running on Kubernetes or, uh, or OpenShift. There are a lot of more pieces at work in a production environment that are difficult to reproduce in a developer environment. So, discrepancies in the way com containers and composite applications are getting configured to talk between each other. So to solve this, usually what we end up using is on our local developer environment tools like uh, Docker Compose to group the application together and all the different services. It's a very convenient technology and tool, but it also brings us into a dead end when we are targeting to deploy to Kubernetes because we need to translate what we are using on our local environment and what we are going to need and will be required in our production environment. With this, there's, there's additional uh, complexity, additional overhead and cognitive load required to go to cloud native and now with, uh, with all this uh, AI wave as well. So challenges which are bringing a wall of discrepancies between what's, what's happening on the development teams and what's expected by the ops team, which creates burden having to convert the different uh, artifacts. As a result, it's also bringing a, an adoption barrier of Kubernetes by the developer. And it's super complicated to reconcile uh, those two worlds together as you might have experienced. So the goal of uh, Podman Desktop is really to provide a, a smooth and simplistic onboarding, helping the developers to go from applications to containers and then to pods that are running natively with Podman because it's, it's part of the core foundation of, uh, of Podman. It's this understanding of Kubernetes, which is part of, uh, of the DNA of uh, the container engine, to then transition to Kubernetes and uh, the production uh, environment that we are targeting. All of this by lowering barriers and reducing the cognitive load required to, 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 to go from 
one step to the next one. And in the past year, we've been putting a lot of focus on, uh, on the Kubernetes uh, capabilities. So now, if you go inside of Podman Desktop, you have the ability to create local Kubernetes cluster. You can set up Kine, or you can set up Minikube. Um, and you will have a UI that allows you to interact with the, the objects that you are going to deploy to, to Kubernetes. We also have ways to group your applications and the different services of your application together. That's what we are calling Podify. Uh, and yeah, Podify that we will see uh, during, uh, during the demo, which I think Cedric is about to, to start. Thanks, Devon. Perfect timing. Who's ready for a live demo? <laughs> nice. Thanks, guys. <laughs> So um, I'm going to just go ahead and bring you to my local development environment where I've already got Podman Desktop installed. Um, but whether you're on um, a Mac, Windows, or uh, a Linux environment, uh, you're able to quickly set up Podman. Uh, and I'll show you at podman-desktop.io. Oh. Well, here is uh, the page where you can learn more and documentation and, and get the right download for your system to essentially set up uh, a virtual machine that runs the containers as containers or Linux. Um, but you can learn about all the features that Podman provides. But what better way to show you than to do a little bit of a live demo and, um, and see some magic, hopefully, fingers crossed. <laughs> so um, Podman 5 just released. There's a lot of improvements if you're working on, say, for example, a Mac, as I am, luckily, uh, for performance and stability. There's a new hypervisor, um, and also for Windows. Um, but from the dashboard, it's really the starting point for your development journey, where you can manage the container engine. You can connect with remote um, uh, Kubernetes environments, like the developer sandbox, which is a free OpenShift cluster that we'll use today. Uh, and learn about different frameworks and languages to work with containers. Um, and this is kind of the, the starting point. But let's say we're working with container images, right? Well, from Podman Desktop, it's really intuitive because I have the ability to not even have to touch the command line because I'm a little bit lazy, um, but to be able to pull from different registries that I can authenticate to, so whether it's Docker Hub or Quay, uh, GitHub, whatever it might be, to uh, essentially also import images in, in the form of tarball files, right? Um, from different container engines uh, to load those in, to build them from my actual application. Um, and I can uh, set up a bunch of different parameters all from this user interface, which makes it really easy for me to not have to go between where I'm doing my development, where I'm building my images, where I'm deploying them. You have this kind of one and all place to do all of these activities and functions. Uh, and we're going to show this in action, but you have the ability to run these containers directly. Uh, you have the ability to work with pods, so one or more containers in one place. Um, and what's really new since last year that, you know, Stevan and the team put a lot of work in is this Kubernetes UI that we're going to look at that allows you to view all of the different or some of the different uh, resources that are in your cluster. So we're going to take a look at routes and services and deployments and be able to modify them on the fly. So it's really, really powerful, I think. Um, and I'll finally, before we hop into the coding section, talk about the extensions. So we've installed a couple of these already. I use Minikube uh, for my local development process, so we have that. But you could use um, uh, Kind uh, or connect to a remote Kubernetes environment with uh, your kube config. So there's a lot of functionality here for kind of supercharging your development environment. But I think without further ado, let's let's uh, let's get started with the uh, with the live demo, right? Yeah, yeah. Cool. So how many of us here are Python developers? Cool. Represent. Nice. Um, so I've got a pretty simple application, and we're going to show this uh, if you want to see the source code at the end, but also deploy this to a remote cluster so you can see it in action. Uh, super simple, so it's a quick website that we kind of uh, want to deploy that has some information about Podman Desktop. It also has a super simple hit counter. We're connecting to a Redis instance, and sorry if this is a little bit small. Um, and essentially, every time someone refreshes the website, we'll get a new hit, and we can kind of um, define that application with a, do with a super simple Docker file or container file. This one is a multi-stage one, so we're starting from the universal base image for Red Hat Enterprise Linux, uh, specifically built for uh, Python or whatever your language could be, to install the tools to build this image, set up a non-root user, install the, the required dependencies, expose the port, et cetera, et cetera. Um, to finally uh, start with a entry point to detect if there's a Redis instance on the host or not, 
and then do a Flask run. Um, if I was to do a Flask run right now, I'd get an error because I don't have Redis running on my system, but this is a great use case for containers, right, to be able to uh, run these as kind of isolated environments so I could spin one up, I could spin one down, um, et cetera. So while I could do a, you know, a Podman build from my command line, what I'm actually going to do is build this uh, using the Docker file here from Podman Desktop. So I'll go over to build this, select the specific container file that we're going to be using here. Uh, the one that I just showed you, we'll give it a name, Quay.io. We'll tag it for my specific registry. Uh, this is the front end of our application, right? We need that Redis instance running. Any arguments we want to add, and we can specify the system. Um, and it looks like repository can't be lowercase. Can be, okay. Let's try it again. There we go. So it's kicking off all of the processes for building this container image, all the dependencies we need. And just like that, we've got a new image tagged, and we can view that within Podman Desktop. So it's easy enough, but while I also have the front end built, I also need that back end. So I could pull from a registry, so I could just pull a default version of Redis. What I've gone ahead and done is actually built Redis with a specific um, Docker file that I'll show you to uh, essentially install Redis on my instance uh, on top of that base image. So having all the security and, and, um, and different certifications that Red Hat Enterprise Linux has, and you can use this as well to, uh, for any of your applications, it's an open, open base image. So we're essentially having that Redis instance, uh, and we're going to containerize that as well. So I'll go over here and build this as well in the back end for, uh, to tag it, and I'll make sure to do it lowercase. Um, we'll build that as well. Um, and so at this point, we've got two images, right? And so if I just search WAD, uh, I can see that we've got uh, a back end and a front end. I'll go ahead and start that back end. We'll give it a name. And this is really a, a nice place to show all the capabilities of being able to, to name your containers, work with volumes for persistent data, port mapping, um, advanced settings, networking, uh, and much, much more. When I go ahead and start this, uh, instantly, we've got this application running, right? The benefits of containers. Uh, we can see different logs from the application. We can also inspect the manifest. And what I'll do is I'll copy the internal host name here uh, from this container that's running. And I'm going to show you this manually, but when we work with pods, it's a little bit different. So take a note of this process right now. When I go back and we start up that front end, right, we'll give it a name of Python front end. Uh, on Mac, AirDrop is already on port 5000. What Podman Desktop does is automatically reroutes that for you. It's very nice. We can add an extra, uh, we can append the host name here with the location of uh, the other container. And just like this, we've got a back end and we've got this front end and we can kind of refresh to see this multi-container application running. And this is awesome, right? Yeah, because at the first demo, live demo you are doing, <laughs> and it worked. <laughs> right, so that's, that's something. Thanks. Thanks so much. So we see uh, both of these containers running. The coolest part is that while it's fun to work with multiple containers, Docker Compose, and there's support for that as well with Podding Up Man Compose from my CLI, if I have this uh, Doom game that I would love to play, but we've got to keep running through, um, I, could, I, could have, I could work with these containers, but then I have to think about how am I going to network them, how are they going to talk to each other, ports, et cetera. All I have to do is select both of them to create a pod. And I'll give it a name. But essentially what's happening is both of these containers will be able to talk to each other on localhost. As you can see, the Redis port isn't being exposed because it's uh, local within that environment of the pod. And this allows me to develop in the same way that I would for an environment like Kubernetes. Because now, these containers have restarted. They're both in a pod. I can see both of the logs. And when we open this up, uh, we can see that the, uh, the ephemeral containers have restarted, but now we've got both of these containers talking to each other within the pod environment. And I think that's, that's a the second demo that is working. Demo, two for two. <laughs> um, real quick, I want to show, if I'm working with pods, right, naturally, let's start to take them to Kubernetes. We've got the extensions for Minikube and Kind, and uh, you can connect to your kubeconfig from down here um, if it's already in your kubeconfig file. I'll go ahead and create a new cluster. And just like this, I can set up a new Kubernetes local uh, containerized environment with uh, version 1.3 um, and start a control plane so I can control this environment directly from Podman Desktop itself. Um, so if I let this finish up here in a second, and I chose kind because it's a lot faster for a demo, um, and I can show that we've got this running. We can see the uh, control plane. 
OC git pods. Well, there's nothing in there right now, but it's really easy to take my uh, pod or my containers, deploy to Kubernetes, view the YAML that's being used, um, and set up an ingress so I can expose that port within the Kubernetes cluster. So just like that, it'll, uh, I'll, well, if I had pushed those images, it would pull them down. That's a great use case for being able to locally um, push an image to a local cluster. Um, but with that being said, um, you can work with remote environments, et cetera, uh, and maybe if we have time at the end, I'll, I'll show that off. But I think we have something really cool to introduce. And Stevan, I'll pass it back to you. Yeah, so thanks, uh, Cedric, for those uh, first cool, uh, cool demos. So <clears throat> we have a new, a new mascot in the, uh, in the Podman uh, family. We are expanding the family and transitioning to uh, a new era. And um, probably you heard that AI is everywhere now, and we are starting to infuse AI into our existing application. In the past, uh, we thought that AI ML was the domain of data scientists and only happening with Jupyter notebooks. But today, all of this is getting redefined, and we are trying to help you, application developers, to get into Gen AI more easily with this new extension that is called uh, Podman AI Lab. Uh, and why we are doing this? It's because it's really a journey for, uh, for adopting generative AI inside of uh, applications. And it can be intimidating. Um, and it can also be costly and risky with your data sensitive in information. Uh, so with AI Lab, our goal is to be helping you on this journey from discovering use cases, evaluating models, experimenting with prompts. Uh, to building your application, understanding how you can wrap your application around LLMs and under the limitations or the non-deterministic aspects of working with LLM. And we will guide you and provide the best practices. So this is where, really, we are focusing on. So Podman AI Lab is, a, is an extension for Podman Desktop uh, that gives the ability to build test and run generative AI-powered application in containers using an intuitive and graphical uh, interface. So there is a, a recipe catalog with mon the most uh, common uh, AI use cases, a curated set of open source models. So we have been looking at the licenses aspect of uh, those models. Uh, so you are safe to be using them. And then we are providing playground environment for learning, prototyping, and experimentation uh, as well. Uh, so it's really to give you the benefits of the convenience and the simplicity of your developer tools and your developer environment that you are already familiar with, but also the cost efficiency of running the models locally, because you don't rely on a cloud uh, and a third party provider to be running uh, the, the model. Uh, and at the same time, you are going to keep ownership and control over the sensitive data that you, you may be uh, using uh, as well. And remember, your data, it's, it's really your gold mine. Uh, it's how you will be able to differentiate and create unique values for your business with AI. So with this, Let's introduce this, uh, this extension. Absolutely. So we saw working with containers and Kubernetes, but what if we apply the same idea of containerization, but now to working with AI? And that's what's been done with this new extension from the catalog, which is called Podman AI Lab. Um, and what's really cool, you can learn more about it if you go to um, the website. Uh, there's a new page for it, new release. Stevan and his team worked really hard on it. Um, but let's kind of test it out here because we have a lot of different functionality that's really comprehensive for those building applications with generative AI. Um, and so there's different starting uh, examples that you can use to quickly set up and bootstrap uh, an application uh, that infuses generative AI in, into it. So what's happening is that with these different examples, uh, and you can learn more about them here, you can essentially clone this to your local development, development environment. Uh, select from different models that you have downloaded, and we'll kind of talk about this here soon. Uh, and I'll go ahead and kick this off so we can um, see this application in action. But there's a lot going on behind the scenes, right? We're working with different models from a catalog 
that Podman AI Lab provides to essentially mount that uh, model in a GGUF format, that quantized format, to a container. And that container is inferencing uh, using Llama C++ so that applications can call it. Um, and so just like that, we have an application running. And we'll show this here in a second. Um, but what's going on behind the scenes is we're working with a variety of different models here. Um, some that come default in the catalog, and then some that I can import from Hugging Face in the form of a GGUF quantized uh, model. Now, we can also serve this uh, as a model for our different applications uh, and work with different playgrounds here. So one of the models I have that I just started with that RAG application that we're going to hopefully go three for three with demos with is um, uh, Mistral. Um, and so let's say we want to start it on a specific container port so we can use it with our applications. Well, we've got this service that, let's say I'm a Java developer, well, I can understand specifically how to integrate this model into my application. So I need to update the application of properties. I need to create some type of service uh, with LangChain as a, as a dependency to make those calls. And I think it's really neat to be able to uh, have this all set up for me as I'm getting introduced to generative AI in whatever language. And as a developer, what I really want when I am interacting with a model, it's an API. It's an endpoint that I am going to, to work with. Exactly. And while it says CPU, we have some news uh, that you'll see here in a second uh, for GPU access. It's been a big kind of hot topic with containers. Uh, we've got some big news for you here. We could set up playground environments. So uh, if I'm using that Mistral model, so I could kind of just create a playground in order to test out different functionality. So if I ask why is the sky blue, uh, I can mess with the different parameters of this model to make it more deterministic, more creative, uh, whatever it might be. Uh, max tokens, et cetera, for my different model. Uh, I can set a system prompt, um, and we can get those responses back and test out what the functionality would be for any of these models that we're working with. Um, but let's go back to this recipe, right? We started it, uh, and this is one of my favorite applications uh, because it uses a pattern uh, known as uh, retrieval augmented generation where we're taking some information uh, from a database that we're going to populate right here. So uh, who was watching the Euro 2024? Okay. so. I'm American, I don't really know who won. So if I was to ask any basic foundation model, um, who won the Euro 2024? Well, there's a lot of limitations with these LLMs. Namely, they were only trained up to a certain point. After they're released, they're automatically out of date. Uh, and RAG allows us to provide more context and information to the model. So uh, we don't have an answer from this base mistral. It could be Llama, it could be any other type of model. Um, what this recipe allows us to do, and I'll take a look at it in the pod section here, is we're setting up uh, multiple different uh, containers here. So one for Chroma DB in order to store uh, documents and, and vectors, uh, one for an inference server, and one for that front end with Streamlit. Yeah, because what is important here is that the recipes, they are already containerized and they are already compliant and uh, compatible with Kubernetes as well. So you can run them as a pod with Podman, but you can also deploy them onto a Kubernetes environment. And, and that's the beauty of it, right? So fingers crossed in our last minute here, with the contextual information that was provided to uh, our vector database here that we can see in the logs, um, which is really nice to see what's going on behind the scenes. Now what's happening is that information has been populated in the vector database. It has a similarity score, and we're pulling that when we're asking this question to the model. Um, so if we reprompt, and this is still on CPU, but you'll notice for model serving and playground environments right now, it's on GPU. Uh, we're going to reprompt the model and figure out, let's see who won it, because I'll show you. Uh, I've got this CNN report of the new information I want to provide the model. And just like that, woohoo! Three for three. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, so you understand why for us it's very important to, to still keep containers and Kubernetes uh, at the root of all this work and all this effort. It's all about agility, flexibility, portability, and scalability. And the same paradigm applies uh, in the world of AI. You may be deploying your models onto, uh, onto, uh, onto dedicated hardware where you will have um, special drivers, optimized frameworks, uh, so imagine you want to, to run the models on edge devices. This is a good way to simplify uh, the journey as well. GPU acceleration for container is a big topic. 
uh, we are working hard on it. Uh, and at the moment, we have, uh, that's what we have been using for the demo. Uh, we are uh, providing the GPU acceleration on Mac. So uh, there is a big effort that is going on on libkeron. Uh, it's available today as an experimental feature. You have the QR code. If you want to try it out, there is a blog post, there is a blog post that uh, allows you to to give it a try, feel free to share feedback. You are, we are looking for it. For Windows, the GPU pass-through already is there uh, with, uh, with WSLQ. So yeah. <clears throat> so next step for us, richer AI ca uh, recipes catalog, more boiler boilerplates for, uh, for AI application, more languages, because today we have Python, but we, we are going to extend it with uh, Java as well. Uh, more frameworks and uh, consistent, uh, always consistency with the production environment. RAG, fine tuning are things that we are going to, uh, to, to add, and uh, there will be an integration of Instruct Lab inside of AI Lab. You will learn about it in the next session, I think so, right? Uh, and, uh, and yeah, there will be more types of AI uh, apps that you will be able to build directly from, uh, from AI Lab. Again, it's open source, so we are welcoming contribution. It's free, so you, there's no lock-in. Uh, and uh, it's there, available from uh, podmandesktop.io. If you are targeting OpenShift and Red Hat platforms, we also have extensions that are dedicated for you to provide you access to Red Hat technologies directly at your fingerprints, uh, fingertips. Uh, uh, from Podman Desktop, there's OpenShift Local, an, um, an image checker, uh, and, uh, and, and more things uh, coming as well. So how to get start? Podman IO, Podman Desktop.io, the repositories under the containers organization, and we also have a, a, a community available uh, also online where you can chat with uh, the entire team and the entire people who are looking at, uh, at Podman and Podman desktop. With this, thanks. Thank you. Thanks for, uh, for uh, being with us today. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you.